I've spent time in the Amazon and on more than one occasion, you know, you will go into some remote group and the people gather around and they're very curious and they want to touch your skin and your instruments and your tents and things. But always at the edge of this chattering happy group of people is a guy looking on who isn't pushing his way forward and who doesn't care about Gore-Tex. And, uh, and this is the shaman. And he is essentially an alienated intellectual. And he observes the, the behavior of his culture from a higher point of view. And in fact, if you know anything about shamanism, you know that worldwide it explores motifs of levels, a transition, ladders are climbed, sacred trees are climbed, magical flights to distant realms are accomplished. The shaman can shift levels. And, you know, we can say, well, this is a way of talking about intoxication or trance or, well, yes, but in fact, when you stop talking about ways of talking and actually get loaded, what you discover is that they were speaking as clearly and concisely as not only they could, but as is possible and that in fact under the influence of at least psychedelics and I'm speaking here from my experience the psyche unfolds it's almost as though it has two conformational geometries one folded tight culture bound paranoid ego driven uh, so forth and so on, the culturally defined persona, the good son, the hard worker, the good mom, so forth and so on, and then uh, absent those cultural constraints and under the, under the influence of a, and let's use the Jungian word, inflating dynamic, like a psychedelic, the, the self, the ontos of being, unfolds into a completely different world. And I maintain that it is not fully grasped within psychological metaphors alone, that this world that is unfolded into is better grasped by mathematical metaphors. And what I mean by that is, this is not a vision, an insight, a trip. This is an other dimension as Riemann, Lobachevsky, and Euclid would understand the word dimension. This is why the shaman can see where the game will congregate, predict the weather, successfully cure, because the shaman is perceiving the world from a higher order mathematical domain that is outside the confines of cultural conditioning. And just, you know, where am I going with this? We're close now. The learning curve was steep, but now a storm-battered cabin. Uh, where this is going is this, this evolution of the shamanic hyperdimensional type out of confined culture is a fractal model for what is happening to us here at the end of history. We are trying to build not a class of shamans, but uh, a shamanic culture. In other words, a culture, and there has never, I think, been a culture of this type on the planet, a culture that actually lived in the light of the fourth dimension. Not, not as passed down through a shamanic class, but as a component of the felt experience of every single member of that culture. And, that's, uh, and that is what this spatial displacement of locality is about, how our minds are spreading over the planet. We are losing our association to our genetically endowed primate bodies. We are no longer, our, our gender self-definition is no longer bound by biological destiny. Our political institutions are designed to free us for class transition. We are in this act of expanding to fill a, a larger mental space. And this is a huge thing. I mean, you hear about the paradigm shift, but 
we're like barnacles on the whale of the paradigm shift, and it's very hard for us to orient toward what is happening. We each think we're having our own private adventure with our career, with our sexuality, with our philosophical understanding, with our psychedelic voyages, with our spiritual teachers. But in fact, you know, notice that everybody else is going through something very similar. And the, uh, the payoff of all of this I think, is uh, a more comfortable mode of being, that we really do feel the weight of some kind of original sin. We are cast from paradise. We, we feel flawed, and if we aren't flawed, we rush to invent flaws. So, you know, if agriculture didn't do the trick, then phonetic alphabets surely will. And if that can't, how about monotheism? And if that can't, how about science? And if that can't, how about political correctness? And on and on and on. We flagellate ourselves uh, for our perceived inadequacies, define ourselves as apart from nature, a fallen creature. And we say this came from the church or the corporation or the king, or, but everybody participated in this particular thought crime uh, along the way. I mean, there were f few brave heretics who held out against it. Now there are many heretics who hold out against it and say the distinction between the artificial and the natural, between the male and the female, between the polis and the wilderness, these things must be erased because they are infantile. They are the things of childhood. Uh, we have come to the end of our childhood as a species, as a semi-cannibalistic, rape-prone, ravenous, uh, copulating, destroying ape species. Business along those lines is a sure bullet in the head for every man, woman, and child on this planet within 500 years, no question about it. And so, what we pride ourselves on is our flexibility. Well, by God, we're going to be put to the test. Uh, everyone must push themselves and must, and the, the great enemy to this process, and people say, are you an anarchist? Are you a nihilist? What are you? Uh, the great enemy to this process of freeing ourselves for a dynamic future, I believe, is ideology. Not bad ideologies, God knows we have enough of them, uh, but ideology itself is a form of neoteny, a, a form of self-juvenilization. It's a cop-out. Uh, a mature, civilized being lives without closure, without the closure provided by Freudianism, Marxism, Buddhism, positivism, capitalism, Zen, the Hopi prophecies, the teachings of the Arturians, or anything else. Living without closure is honest living, and it's uncomfortable because there's something about the anal retentive primate mind that we want to button it down, you know, and say, well, it's this or it's that, with no sense of irony, no sense of scale, no tongue-in-cheek approach at all. I mean, if you met a termite who aspired to understand the cosmic workings of the universe, you would just roll your eyes at such a naive, uh, misunderstanding of one's own position in the cosmos. Well, do you think we stand so far from where the termite stands that our musings about how the cosmos works are carrying much force? I don't, I don't think so. Well, then people say, well, but without ideology, I mean, isn't it, aren't we supposed to reject fascism and choose community and... Uh, no, I mean, at a certain stage, yes, but this is the, the sophomoric stage of becoming a, an, an intellectual person. It, once you've reached the hoary ages that I now reside in, you see, and, and notice, you know, I, I had a... 
I visited my doctor recently, and as I was getting dressed, he said, you know, in the 19th century, most people your age were dead. <laughs> and I thought of that remark on many different levels, and I realized culture is a con game designed to bewilder you for 35 to 40 years. And then if by some miracle you can outlive that span of time, a strange realization will begin to dawn as you sit at the poker table. You'll realize, this is a, this is a bunch of crap. <laughs> no, I've been had. Well, up until very recently, only a very few people in any society lived into those ages, and then that was called wisdom. Uh, he said, you know, he just sits on his porch and rocks and occasionally chuckles. Uh, but now, because the cultural dialogue is so frank and because so many people live to very ripe old ages, the, the biologically generated con of culture is being seen through. And it, the falsity of ideology is exposed for what it is, something that you bamboozle children with for 30 years. But beyond that, it, it doesn't serve. Well, so then what is to fill this void that has always been filled by passionate convictions, regardless of what they might happen to be? Uh, what is to fill the void is what I call, and I mentioned it earlier, the felt presence of immediate experience, the felt presence of immediate experience. This is sufficient. This is, it's hard for us, armored as we are, and, and defocused from the moment as we are by our previous imbibing of toxic cultural values. Occasionally we touch this. Well, I think psychedelics are the way back that you can train yourself. And there may be other roads back, meditation and so forth. But psychedelics is the fast track, I would argue, <laughs> uh, to a, a, a sense of here and nowness, a sense of bodhi mind, a sense of stillness, a sense of connectivity to the Gaian uh, intent. And with that, the morphogenetic dynamic that is unfolding becomes exhilarating adventuresome, trust, you, you can reach down into it and trust nature. Without it, it's all paranoia and should I stockpile food and what should I do with my investments and where am I going to run to given this catastrophe, that catastrophe. Uh, you know, people are so agitated by the notion of the end of the world and yet don't seem to notice that the end of their world is a pretty sure bet. Uh, <laughs> most people are dead. I hate to be the one to break it to you. <laughs> Whatever dead means, we don't know. But most people are in that condition. Uh, uh, and so it shall come to us, presumably, in one form or another. Well, compared to your own self-extinction, issues like the end of the world seem like fairly abstract political matters. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, that corporate capitalism and object fetishism, which seem to be two human traits that cross-fertilize each other, are run on anxiety and that this anxiety uh, is, uh, trivializes what it is to be human, and that all of nature waits upon human beings to awake from the delusion of history and to re-embrace uh, the living processes uh, that nature represents. And the medium of exchange are the psychedelics. They are very mysterious. I anybody who thinks they simply, through perturbation of brain chemistry or something, allow, uh, I don't know, repressed material from the personal unconscious to come into focus. This is such a dumbing down of what it is. These things carry intelligence far greater intelligence than our own. An ocean of alien intelligence moves through the vegetable world 
which is ancient beyond imagining on this planet. I mean, it goes back 500, 600 million years. And an ocean of very strange intelligence, but approachable, at least approachable enough to be identifiable as intelligence, resides there. And we have wandered from this and in our hubris built these paranoid schemes into our behaviors that I call cultural values, and they have pushed us now uh, into very precarious places. So it's time to come back. And, uh, you know, this is pretty eggheady stuff. You can't shout this on the street corners. But as I said, we represent the f upper 10, 5% of the pyramid of privilege and connectivity on this planet. And if we can begin to talk this way, think about things in these terms, transcend ideologies, uh, and we will move forward and we will assuage the anxiety of those less fortunate and further down uh, on the social pyramid. And I'm really serious about this ideological thing. I mean, because I see that there's a kind of bifurcation, which we I almost said ahead, but no, we are in this bifurcation right now. And it's whether we shall fragment into cult or embrace this thing I'm talking about, which is living without closure. Cult is no answer. Cult is the old answer repackaged in smaller sizes. Uh, no human being has greater insight into your circumstance than you do. If you've somehow managed to convince yourself that this is not the case, you need to seriously think it through, uh, because our perspectives are unique. We can generalize from one person to another, but no one is a p in a position to claim leadership. It's unnecessary. The dynamic of the situation is larger than any single human being, and anyone who says, I understand, I know, follow me, is certainly not to be invited home to dinner or tithed to, or because uh, no one knows. It is a mystery, and a mystery is not an unsolved problem. This is what science has led us to assume. All mysteries, you hire people, they gather data, the mystery goes away. Only, only the trivial edges of the mystery can be illuminated in that fashion. The core of being is pure contradiction. Life is death. Death is life. The past is the future. The present is eternity. And comprehending this is not to become some kind of uh, ivory tower intellectual. Comprehending this is to move past intellectual concepts to actually embrace uh, love. Love is what waits beyond uh, abandoning the search for closure. Love is not closure. Love is a challenge, emotion, being in the purest sense, not becoming. This is the realm of becoming, and it is always striving, and it is always incomplete. Love is the realm of true being, and it lies beyond the prison of culture, beyond the prison of ideology, beyond the prison of self-defined limitations. Thank you. <laughs>